just like to welcome everybody to Easter Sunday at the Nelson Unitarian Spiritual Center. Um, and I know that uh, there's a few special things that have been organized for you today, and I think that we will, um, uh, Jeff, we will begin. John and Ellie, are you? system. Um, and, and we all should, hey? It's uh, just a question of, for all of those of us who have some difficulty with our hearing, uh, we don't want to miss what the offerings are from all of us. So um, please use the mic. We'll pass it around. Um, we will begin. Um, we will begin with our song. I have chosen for the month, um, which you have copies of, and there's more copies right back there. The song is Come, Come, Wherever You Are. <laughs> Whoever you are. Wherever, wherever you are. Come, come, you are. come, come, whoever you are. So this group will start first at the third verse, and this group will come in shortly thereafter. Um, you'll, you'll get the sense of it. We're going to try it, and we'll see. I really are not, I'm not the choir leader, but I'm trying. Oh, 
everybody's job. Thank you. Um, okay. Now we like the jobs this morning. sacred occasion. But for Christians all over the world, this is a really important day. Um, and we will hear more from, Je from Janet about that during, during the service. Um, but it is a moment of hope. Hope is something we all really, really need these days. And so, I offer up this light uh, to bring a little bit more light into the world and to honor this day. Um, I'd like to take a moment now for joys and concerns for people to uh, come up and celebrate, show gratitude, let people know difficult times that they have. I'd like to light a candle in for joy, joy, much joy today for this sunny weather and for this we're able to be here and also for our new sound system. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. My name is Keith. I, I have been here lately uh, because I've been in Alberta attending to my both my parents actually, and, and my father is uh, nearing his last day. Uh, we, we, he's just hovering, and um, it's it's a very uh, a wonderful process. It's it's very painful, but it's been just so meaningful to be with with them. Uh, as my dad prepares to leave. Um, uh, so I've had a very intense few weeks and uh, very, very uh, enjoyable um, in, a, in, a, in, a, you know, in a real experience way. Um, uh, my dad's been wonderful, very generous, and full of love and trepidation and grief. And so it's, I've, I've come through a very interesting time. And there's more to come because nobody will say when he's going to die. <laughs> it, could, it could be today, we just don't know. So, and, and well, let's just say one more thing. He, he's been offered uh, a, the opportunity to schedule it, to, 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 to push off. Um, and he, can't, he doesn't want to do that. And uh, that's very interesting too. So it's been a really, uh, really intense and uh, wonderful time. Thank you. Um, Did you say your name? Yes. Did I say my name? You did. My name is Jacqueline McGregor. And um, I have an interesting, um, I have a candle of joy. I was just in Europe. Um, in England, I was there for the first time after 40 years after emigrating here, and um, and I got to go up to um, Derbyshire where my dad was born, and um, so 
Sorry, am I judging all of us? Thanks, Marsha. All right then. Um, and and so there's this cute little. Um, my cousin was uh, in Belper um, in England, which is this brick village, and it's and it's been there for, of course, many many hundreds of years. But in the 17th and 18th century, there was a um, a factory, and it is unique in that the factory owner developed a school for the children and also a park for the workers to go to afterwards. And my cousin was very impressed with this story. And I went on a little ramble and I came across a plaque. And the plaque was dedicated to the factory owner um, who had instituted all of these very progressive policies and humanitarian policies. But it turns out that not only was he progressive, but he was a Unitarian. And in <laughs> Belgrade, there is a little Unitarian church there. And I took a photo. I'll probably post it on Facebook. But it was remarkable because I thought, wow, what an interesting story. It turns out he was a Unitarian. <laughs> Here's to Unitarians from hundreds of years gone by and to a tradition that we're upholding. Thank you. Um, lots of things that are are going wrong right oh yeah i'm Allie. Allie. i'm Allie. lots of things are going wrong in my life right now and i want to celebrate something that's not i saw a bluebird oh, nice. oh. absolutely i went oh my that's blue and then i got the binoculars out and it was just there it was sitting there right you know oh. right in front of the lake so i was delighted and this morning i saw the swallows so it's like spring must be here All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you can't see. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. There's, there's a gap up here, too. Thank you. Mm. My name's Jenny. I want to celebrate the Easter Bunny. <laughs> now, I didn't grow up with an Easter Bunny. I grew up knowing I was a miserable sinner. So I'm grateful to my grandchildren who are so excited about the Easter Bunny. So here's to the Easter Bunny. <laughs> years ago, uh, Karen and I bought a van uh, because we needed a place to live. And we always kind of hung on to it because, you know, you never know, you might just need to move back into it. Uh, yesterday, uh, we had the pleasure of spending some time with a young woman from Italy, Margarita. And she's going to go traveling. <coughs> and she just spent last week in a grief ritual. And when she came back to see us, it was like, I don't know, she was just lighter and brighter, just like the spring air. And she's going to go traveling. And my wife looked at me. Do you know how your wife could look at you with that look in her eyes? <laughs> Anyway, she, she gave away our van. <laughs> and uh, Margarita texted us last night up at, from Johnson's Landing. And she took the rocks from the 
that represented her ancestors in the grief ritual. And she put them in Kootenai Lake. And she asked, is it possible the goddess of the lake could sing to me? Blessings. Um, I'm just going to add a little bit to the Easter Bunny thing. If any, I don't know if everyone's seen it, but there's been an amazing little video going around Facebook with a man. I guess somebody videotaped this man talking with his daughter. Oh, yeah. I've seen it. <laughs> who was asking about the Easter Bunny. Oh, my God. And basically, you know, queried what relationship the Easter Bunny has with Easter. And, and ultimately says, but Dad, were Jesus and the Easter Bunny best pals? <laughs> <laughs> so I light this candle for all of the unspoken and deeply felt uh, joys and concerns that are here and elsewhere in the world. Okay. Um, okay. Jealous. Hello. Stendic. I'm very glad to be back. For those of you who weren't here last week, I did the metaphysical meaning of Easter, and I have handouts for that with some work to be done, which I did myself during the week. I went through the questions and answered them and did some deep spiritual work. Um, today is Easter Sunday and 2.1 billion people all over the planet are affirming life instead of death. And I appreciated someone sharing that their grandchildren uh, brought the Easter Bunny and got them out of an old story and brought them into a new story. And that's what I hope to share with you today. When I was preparing for this, Allie um, and John were telling me that they have the prayer of Jesus in the original language and the Aramaic. So I wanted to start with that so we could hear the sounds of it. They're going to speak it in Aramaic just because we are standing in a 2,000-year-old tradition. And when we stand in that, there's power. When we stand with people for 2,000 years, whatever the belief, life-affirming belief, there's power in that. So to hear the original language, we'll speak it in English, and that's the handout, and then they will sing it in Aramaic. And I'd like to just set the tone of this happening in connection with people all over the world for 2,000 years who take this day, however they understand it, literally, metaphysically, however the understanding is, we join with them in life-affirming prayers. So Easter really is about life over death. That's the affirmation. So our own hearts, our own souls that are immortal and eternal really know this. And the story, the cultural story, is a way for us to try to experience this. And so we use Easter as one way to deepen in that and to really connect with our own souls that have always been and always will be. So um, we'll just do the prayer. <clears throat> oh, did you get a copy? I didn't take this. We have extra copies. So what's going to happen is they are going to speak it in Aramaic, then we are going to say it in English. And this is what makes it so interesting, because when you're translating from 2,000 years ago or from another language, you bring in new things. So our understanding will increase. And this is the original prayer in Aramaic in the translation. And then they'll sing it. And if you could just tune not only your ears, but your heart to the idea that 
especially for Western civilization, that people have spoken this, have said this, with hope in eternal life. That's the real depth of the story. I'd just like to say that uh, Neil Douglas Klotz, uh, uh, Aramaic scholar of uh, many, many years, has brought this, uh, be this prayer to life and um, also made a dance out of it, which we do uh, at the um, uh, Sufi dancing, uh, dance is universal peace. And um, uh, the thing that he cautions about translating is uh, all of the possible meanings. And this is just one that we've given you here. There, there are all kinds of translations, as, as Janet says, as it comes down to the, to the time. But, but this, is, this is close to the original. Okay, so we'll read it in Aramaic first. Okay, I'll, I'll do it then. Okay. <clears throat> Abun de Bashmaya. Nakadish Shemak, Tete Mal Puta, Newe Seviana Aikana de Boshmaya Af Baara, Hablan, Lakman de Sukanan Yomana, Washboklan, Kabayen Wakahen, Aikana Daf Kanan, Shwobokan, Kabayen, Waylan, Tala, Le Nesyuna, Ela, Patsan, Min Bisha. Nito Yolaki Malkuta Wehala Waktesh Buta La Alam Almin Almain. So now you'll read it in English all together. If, if, if you want, you can join us. So it's uh, uh, O Birther, Father, Mother of the Cosmos, you create all that moves in light. Focus your light within us, making it useful as the rays of a beacon show the way. Create your reign of unity now through our fiery hearts and willing hands. Your one desire then acts with ours, as in all light, so in all forms. Grant what we need each day in bread and insight, subsistence of a call of growing life. Loose the cords of mistakes binding us as we release the strands we hold of our guilt. Don't let us enter forgetfulness, but free us from unrightness. From your own, from you is born all ruling will, the power and the life to do, the song that beautifies all, from age to age renews. Through the power of these statements, may they be the source from which all my actions grow, sealed with trust and faith. Amen. And now we'll sing. Abunda Bashamaya, Abunda Bashamaya, Abunda Bashamaya, Abunda Bashamaya, the Kadishamak, the Kadishamak, the Kadishamak. Nakadishmak Te te makota Te te makota Te te makota Te te makota Nebwe sabiana kakana Devashmaya auf bara. Newe sevyana akana. Devashmaya auf bara. Hablan lakma. Desun kanan yomana. Wash 
Jesus is a consciousness of love and forgiveness, a transformative consciousness that's on the planet. I went through the Barabbas, who everybody is in the story. If you didn't get it, you'll please get one of these handouts. This morning, I'm just continuing the story to the place of this morning in the story. Mary Magdalene shows up at the tomb of Jesus, and she gets there because... She wants to anoint the body and check on the body that has been harmed. And she is a disciple and a follower of Jesus, and she has been witness to him on the cross. She's been witness to the last words, forgive them, they know not what they're doing. I commend my spirit into thee. You can imagine being a friend and having a crucifixion and having to deal with all the emotions of that, and especially if this friend is a high spiritual teacher in your life and you're having to really come to terms with it, you wouldn't know what to do, but going to the tomb is a way to anoint the body, to gather to an expression of love. When she gets there, the stone is rolled away. A huge stone, as the story goes, is rolled away. Unbelievably big and how did it happen? So she knows that somebody must have done this. Someone moved this, to to uh, this big stone. And she walks in, and there's just the slab where Jesus was and the cloth that he was wrapped in, but he's gone. Her first response is, who stole the body? Who did this? Because she's in an environment where, as Jesus is being who he really is, and expressing love and forgiveness, the culture doesn't accept that. They can't embrace it. Now, if you take this story to understand it to be our story, this is what happens when we come to certain places that we can't comprehend what has happened. We just don't understand it. So for Mary, she goes in there, the tomb's empty. She can't, the only way that she can understand that is on a very physical plane, a plane of here and now. Like, who stole the body? Who did this? And she starts walking, and it's recorded that someone that looks like the gardener starts walking with her. And they're walking together, and they're talking, and all of a sudden, he calls her name, Mary. Mary and she recognizes his voice. She cannot recognize him physically, but she recognizes his voice. This is my favorite part of the story because if we're listening intently, God is always calling us. God always has our name on its lips in some way. And if we're willing to get out of, it just can't happen. How could this be? 
will hear our name. I wanted to read this this morning because I feel like this will integrate the story. When a caterpillar nears its transition, and this is true, it begins to eat ravenously, consuming everything in sight. The caterpillar's body then becomes heavy, outgrowing its own skin many times, until it is too bloated to move. Attached to a branch, upside down, it forms a chrysalis, an enclosing shell that limits the caterpillar's freedom for the duration of the transformation. Within the chrysalis, a miracle occurs. Tiny cells that biologists actually call imaginal cells begin to appear. These cells are wholly different from the caterpillar cells, carrying different information, vibrating to a different frequency. The frequency of the emerging butterfly at first the caterpillar's immune system perceives these new cells as enemies and attacks them. Much as new ideas in science, medicine, politics, and social behaviors are viciously denounced by the powers now considered mainstream, but the imaginal cells are not deterred. They continue to appear in even greater numbers recognizing each other, bonding together until the new cells are numerous enough to organize into clumps. When enough cells have formed to make structures along the new organizational lines, the caterpillar's immune system is overwhelmed. The caterpillar body then becomes a nutritious soup for the growth of the butterfly. When the butterfly is ready to hatch, the chrysalis becomes a nutritious soup. And when the butterfly is ready, the chrysalis becomes transparent. The need for restriction has been outgrown, yet the struggle toward freedom has an organic timing. Today, I think we're in that transformative state. We're imaginal selves. I appreciated the sharing of Unitarians in other parts of the world. These are people, clusters, their cells, their consciousness cells that cluster and gather. And when enough of us gather and awaken to new life, that death cannot hold us when we really can move into that Christ consciousness, that who we are is being called to be that, our imaginal cells gather and we start to form in clusters and something new can emerge. It's been trying to emerge for 2,000 years that we are spiritual beings with spiritual power, with the ability to come forth in greater and fuller ways. We have the ability to heal, the ability to transform, the ability to be butterflies to come out of the chrysalis. This is the work of our time, and we have that within us, but until we believe it, until we go to the tomb and say, oh, who, not who stole the body, but we actually could go in with the consciousness that a body could rise, that death couldn't hold us, that we are so much more than our physical self, the story has no meaning. When it's taken so literally, the person who shared about the sin and the pain before the butterfly, when it's taken that literally, then people go off into uh, a certain kind of consciousness and the new cells cannot find their way there even though they're there. The imaginal cells are not in the chrysalis. There's something that draws, they're drawing just like we have stuff in our lives, higher thoughts about who we are, what's happening in our lives, what's going on for us personally and collectively, those cells are out there calling us to the next level of our evolution, that we are to come out of the dead spaces, that we keep holding on, I can't do that, I can't be healed. It's all a story, and it's a story of consciousness, and the story has been told for 2,000 years, these and greater things you shall do. This is the story. This is what Easter is all about. I'm a Christian for that story. I stand in that story. I believe it. I accept it. Because the God I love has to be much bigger than the story I tell. 
It just has to move me in that way. However it moves you, that's up to you. You can find your way because your imaginal selves are calling you to your story, to the place you find God, to the place you find God within your own heart, the place of forgiveness. Jesus was the total example of what it means to let go, to not take the baggage with us. How many times are we taking stuff, retelling the same story, this happened to me, blah, blah, blah. I could go on. Maybe I'm the only storyteller that tells these stories, but I have a, enough of them to <laughs> But I like that the imaginal cells are wholly, they're, they're completely different from what is. And this is, if you are doing deep spiritual work, and this is your call. Easter is the time. This holy season is the time for you to actually ride a cultural wave. 2.1 billion people are affirming life, are affirming these and greater things you can do. I am the Christ. They are affirming Jesus' presence on earth as a person or however you understand it. It's something that's so powerful and so profound. And... I love the Easter Bunny, but I know it's a sidetrack, and it's part of the, the fertility rites and the things that spring bring, which is another language of God. That's God, that's another language of God. If you look at spring and Easter eggs and bunnies, it's the prolificness of life. You know, I had a friend that was telling me that, you know, really anti, you know, prosperity, anti-good, and I realized this person really shrinks. And I said, how can you look at nature and think that you should have nothing? God is prolific, abundant, ready to give us all things. But we need the imaginal self. We need to get out of our own limitation so we can get it. Apply it to the place in your own life where you are feeling stuck, where you are feeling, I am just not moving there. I can probably guarantee, like for myself, when I'm in those places, it's always forgiveness. It's either forgiving myself, someone else, the culture, something that moves me out of attachment to a story where new cells cannot make themselves visible and known. It's a very profound, deep time in the culture. It's not to be taken lightly if you're, if you're really walking a spiritual path. It's in a, create a beautiful story. I love that it was a different frequency. The whole story talks in imaginal cells talks about a different frequency. And we're in a different, culturally we're in a different frequency and as things speed up and we, I look at the culture and see things accelerating for those who cannot walk into a tomb and even grasp the possibility, even grasp the possibility because they haven't quite proved it. That's why I love the imaginal selves, because it's science. It's not a story, it's not interpretive, it's not instructive, it's science. This is a scientific fact on imaginal selves, provable. You have to get your mind around it. We're part of that. We're part of those imaginal selves. It's, um, and um, I wanted to read from a beautiful book called The Advance of Love, and this is an ecologist who just, um, and a minister who embraced the Easter story in his way. He's a um, United Church of Canada minister, uh, Bruce Sanguin. He says, another big story that had the disciples confused was the story of God. On one hand, their faith told them that God was all-powerful and in charge of history. On the other hand, they had just witnessed their spiritual leader's crucifixion at the hands of Caesar. So who was in charge of history, God or Caesar? They were experiencing a clash of narratives. Imagine having witnessed a crucifixion and then hearing a few days later that the guy who was crucified is alive. It's bound to be a little confusing. <laughs> it might have been an idle tale. Caesar just finished crushing God. This story that the women brought to them was hard to believe, the story that the tomb was empty. A story <coughs> implying that love is stronger than violence, that life 
is the context for death, and that the, and that the kind of humanity that Jesus represented could not be snuffed out by the kind of human being that had executed him. That's the Easter story in a nutshell. And I'm asking myself, which story am I going to believe? The story of death or the story of life? The story of God affirming human dignity or God abandoning us to the worst in us? Christ is risen, idle tale or love's testament? <clears throat> I just invite you to, you know, just take a moment in your own heart on this day to just join with 2.1 billion people and just join me in this prayer of heart opening to love's testament. Beloved, infinite creator, we just open our hearts to love's testament. We know we don't comprehend the story in all of its unfoldings, but in our own heart, reveal to us what it is that we need to do to rise again, to bring forth love and forgiveness on this planet, to ourselves, to our family. Guide us and give us the courage to stand before the cross, whatever that may be, and know that your presence will bring us through to the other side, to life. So if you want to just gently bring yourself back into the room, and I know last week I appreciated people sharing whatever it was that came to them, it was very deep and rich, and if anyone has that, that sharing, I please, please share. I'd like to say that was very beautiful, very touching, very real. Reminded me of what butterflies come from. They're, they're caterpillars, and they're all caterpillars just turning into butterflies. There's wisdom. And I deeply want to thank you. I, I, um, I feel very enriched by what you had to say today. I, uh, I remember when I first read about imaginal selves and and the whole concept of they're there but they're not really there and the caterpillar cells think that they're that tries to kill them off and then you know the whole whole concept of how a butterfly a, a caterpillar becomes or transforms into a butterfly it's like if someone wrote this out in a story and you never knew the science of it no believe it. It's a fantastic, unbelievable story, and yet it's true. So, I mean, that's exciting to me. It really is. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it was, yeah. it's still exciting. Yeah, I, I was connecting to, um, there, there's a Unitarian um, minister who talks about um, the butterfly effect. Um, and 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 it's such an it's such a lovely story um, that connects with this because scientists often believe that what is science is science it's rooted it's stuck but it's not that the butterfly effect is is that time after time there have been new realities that that scientists have created cells have changed crystals have changed in science that have happened simultaneously across the world. And, and it's called the butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's quite an interesting thing. Science moves. Yeah. And then I appreciate it.
how you shared the story, <coughs> particularly um, Mary hearing her name, mm -hmm. recognizing the voice of her teacher in the gardener calling her name. And I appreciate you telling the story that, and the butterfly story in a way that leaves us with questions, with our own experience to interpret that. And uh, makes me uh, want to be more aware to listen and to hear uh, when I'm not sure, you know, what's the most loving thing I can do? How do I be compassionate here? How do I respond here when I'm challenged or afraid or unknown? And just the possibility that maybe I'll hear an answer and how to, how to, how to be of service. And uh, so thank you for not giving the answer. <laughs> I wish I had it. <laughs> I appreciate that because that's been part of my prayer in life. It's like I say, God, just speak my name and let me listen. Just let me hear. Because I don't know what to do in lots of situations. And sometimes, you know, I'll even say my own name enough times so that my own higher self, I just say my name. Like I love to write my name sometimes just not from an ego place, but I'm listening. That's what I say, I'm listening. Yeah. And so. it doesn't make sense always. You know, in some ways, I heard something really important through you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm in love with that, so thank you. I'm, I'm struck by... Um, One of the things I love about a great story is that it seems to transcend cultures. And um, the story seems to, to speak to what some folks in some other cultures have, have run up against. And I think, you know, perhaps what I've run up against in, in my own life as well. I can remember one of my mentors. In a, in a cave everybody from his village could see what was in the cave and what they were working with and the people that had come from Europe and North America couldn't see it <laughs> now when he looked at them and said how, how are we going to work together when we don't even see the same thing I'm, I'm going to leave here and go up to a sweat lodge and some of the sweat lodge leaders have, have, have said something similar too. That there seems to be something in our experience, if not our genetics, that has the eyes and the ears and the nose see and hear and smell different things. So what's true is is very hard to verify with just your eyes. <laughs> and uh, you know, I had another mentor who talked about the virus in the eyes. That, and that, that weighs so the question I'm, I'm carrying with me and I'll carry it into the sweat lodge is, how do I cure the virus in my eyes so that before I walk into the cave I can see everything that's actually there or not there? Thank you for today. As I walk over, um, the concept of a cultural ethos um, has been, and the differences in cultural ethos, uh, even across Canada, creating different visions. And it's something that needs to be overcome. We need to go deep, um, as we've been hearing today, to find the place where uh, the well is. And I, I can't resist. I have a small story. 
that uh, it just shows that there was a, two young women were walking and one was an Ojibwe uh, and she had lived her, uh, her traditional life. And she said, oh, there's a cricket. They were walking down in uh, Vancouver, busy, busy street. And the other young woman, she said, what do you mean, a cricket? She says, don't you hear that cricket? She says, no. They walked over to a planter, a big planter, and there was, and she saw the cricket. She says, what do you have, super hearing? She says, no, I don't have super hearing. She says, well, how could you possibly, with horns honking and people and all this, how could you hear that? She says, watch. She took a handful of change out of her pocket and dropped it on the sidewalk. Everybody's head turned. She said, it depends on what you learn to listen for. <laughs> um, anyone else? Okay, well, um, I'm, I'm going to put on our, our closing song today. I'd just like to oh. thank John and Nellie for, um, they came over to my house and we spoke and probably did our own workshop around this and um, answered the questions. Please get one of these handouts if you didn't get one. They're really very helpful in working through cultural stories. And um, thank you for today. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah. And if you want to take the papers home with you, you can. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you can leave them and we'll, we'll collect them. We have a banner there. With oh, and the, oh, that's right. The banner there is, is the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. Read yeah, if you want to read it directly in Aramaic, there you go. <laughs> just, just pull out a couple of your imaginal cells and. on the screen.
offering. basket is coming around. It keeps us uh, able to pay the rent and hopefully to buy sound equipment and things like that. <laughs> um, and I, I welcome whatever contribution you want to make. As the offering basket goes around, I will um, do the extinguishing of the light. Um, I think wonderful light has been shed and opened up in our hearts and in our minds, and, and even a little maybe in our souls. Um, and we are not extinguishing that light as we extinguish the flame today. As we're not extinguishing that light as we extinguish the flame, flame today, um, we're just sending that energy out to all of it. Uh, the basket needs to go around the back row. Back row. No, it's already gone there. Oh, well, we, we yeah. saw it. This back row. <laughs> this back row. This back row. It's amazing what the eyes see and don't see. <laughs> um, and so the light will carry be carried in everyone's hearts as they leave here today and hopefully will be full in the energies of all the people in the world today as well. Um, Now announcements. Uh, uh, next week on the 23rd, Dina Romoff uh, from Spokane is coming to uh, share um, her life as a Unitarian, lesbian, feminist, activist, Wiccan, pagan, Jewish woman. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it, it's uh, I've known Dina since 1983, and I think that she will be um, a light for everybody here. And I hope you enjoy her, and I hope that you come. Uh, so that's next week, and hopefully the bio, etc., etc., will come out uh, from Anne this week as well. If you don't have your name on the mailing list, please get it to Anne so that she can um, put you on the list, and you'll get the information. Um, two um, Tuesday night is our movie night, and I'm going to ask Bo to tell us the name of the movie. So the movie is uh, starring um, Tom Hanks, and it's called The Terminal. And some of you may have may have seen it, but it's, it's a comedy. And it's also very heartwarming, and uh, it carries a message too. It's at seven o'clock, and it's here. And it's here. Tuesday. Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday night. Popcorn. Popcorn. <laughs> Is there popcorn? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Says right. Yes. popcorn <laughs> this time. Any other announcements? Yes. Yes. Um, ne next Saturday is April 22nd, Earth Day, and it's also the, the 22nd of each month is when the, 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 the interfaith group has been having a climate vigil, so they're combining it all at Earth Day with a special event uh, starting at 3 o'clock at Lakeside Park, it's also sponsored by the Equa Society and the, the Interfaith Climate Vigil Group, and there's going to be some celebrations, and they're going to have some 
music and games and I think even a dinner uh, all in Lakeside Park to celebrate Earth Day next Saturday. Yeah, the 22nd. Just a couple of organizational announcements. One, uh, our leader next month in May is Keith, and we've been having a leader, Marcia has done this month, and Keith will do next month, and we're hoping for folks who are interested in being a service leader or have ideas for our services, please come and see me, and we'll uh, make sure you get the right information, training, mentoring for that to happen. And I do you want to mention at the end of the month we have a special guest? Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah. At the end of the month, Deborah Thorne is coming up from Beacon Congregation down in New Westminster. Deborah Thorne is the minister there, and she's uh, kind of holding space for us to um, emerge as a solid congregation that'll walk forward on its own. It's wonderful. Um, and she's going to be speaking about belonging or being a part of something. And there'll be a, an opportunity to spend time with her most of the day on Saturday. Uh, she's going to meet with the board for a while, and she's going to meet with the chaplaincy committee for a little while, and we're going to do a general workshop on how to create the space for people to feel welcome and, and get a sense of what it might mean to be a, a member of the Nelson Unitarian Spiritual Center. So I'm um, looking forward to that. And then she's going to do a service on, on Sunday, and um, we actually know the music a few weeks in advance. <laughs> so if you go to the Facebook page, there's YouTube links to the music, and you can at least hear the tunes and kind of go over the words in your mind, and Jacqueline and I and a few others are going to get together and see if we can practice a little bit. <laughs> so that, that's going to be lots of fun as well. And I think um, there's, there's a good chance within the next couple of months um, we could end up with a chaplain in our a, a lay chaplain <laughs> me um, so with any luck at all before the summer's over we might actually be able to start doing uh, weddings and name change ceremonies and right all the rites of passage sorts of, of things so we should be thinking about that in the backs of our minds as well exactly what I was going to mention there's a chaplaincy program that we have where Fortunate to have Ray that can volunteer to be our, our chaplain has done some training. So we're just looking at getting him uh, the stamp of approval and registered and to be able to do those things on behalf of our congregation. Well, folks, that's a wrap for today. And thank everybody thank for their you. contributions their energy and their uh, spirit and their words and their hearts. So there's coffee, I think, still, and uh, some cookies and whatever. Feel free to stick around and help us put the chairs and away. And, the table. And, and, the and there's books on the table. Oh, and there, yes, and there's extra ones of yours. I just put them in your suit. Yeah. Okay.